Good morning. We welcome you all to our worship today. This is the third Sunday in the Lenten season. I said before that long ago, this is many, many years ago, uh, Lent was so special and the Sundays were so special uh, to the Christians that they gave names to these Sundays. It usually followed the first word of the psalm that they picked for the day, which was kind of the theme for the day. Today is known as Okuli in the history of the church. Now this tied in with the new converts that were coming to the church at that time. Easter time and Lenten time then was a time of, I guess you would say, confirmation in many ways. This was more of the adults who were coming out of the pagan world into the Christian world. And at Easter time, they would then be baptized. But before the baptism would take place, they would be instructed in the Christian faith. So they understood everything. Well, on this third Sunday in Lent, they were allowed to come into the church service. How about that? For a little bit of time. And then, oh, they would stay for the lessons, I believe it was. And then they would go to their instruction period. A little bit different than the way we do things today. Okay? The psalm for the day was similar, well, actually from the same psalm as last week. Last week was known as Reminiscere Sunday. That means remember. And the words were on Psalm 25, O Lord, remember your mercy and your love. And it was teaching the new confirmands that the Lord is always mindful of his people and always reaching out to them and reaching to them also. And that they should remember that his mercy and his love always endures so that they should come to him in every occasion in life. Well, this Sunday is called Okuli. And you all know what that means, right? You all have your Latin down just like that. Latin, the Latin word means my eyes. And it's in the same Psalm 25. My eyes are ever on the Lord. Now think about that. These are new confirmation students or new, new uh, catechumens who are coming and they're just learning about the Lord. And now they're learning that my eyes are ever upon the Lord for any situation that takes place in this life. And especially as he walks on his way to Calvary to die on the cross to be my savior, my eyes are ever on the Lord. You'll hear some of those thoughts still in the service today, even though we don't follow the themes that were there so many years ago. But remember that, my eyes are ever on the Lord. This third Sunday, then, we follow the order of Holy Communion. That'll be the first setting that you find in your hymnal. And we'll begin with the singing of our opening hymn. Our opening hymn is 631. 631, Speak, O Savior, I am listening.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment, both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And we take a moment of silence to reflect on those words. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as an atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue on page 156. This morning we speak the responses. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. This morning we'll sing the glory be to God without the accompaniment. Mm. Glory be to God on high. And on earth peace, good will toward men. We praise you, we bless you, we worship you, we glorify you, we give thanks to you for your great glory. O Lord God, heavenly King, God the Father Almighty, O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sin of the world, Receive our prayer. You sit at the right hand of God the Father. Have mercy on us. For you only are holy. You only are the Lord. You only, O Christ, with the Holy Spirit. Our most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, whose glory is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways and bring them again with penitent hearts, that they might set their eyes on you, and in steadfast faith embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated.
We now turn our attention to the scripture lessons for the day. If you care to follow along, you'll find them printed on the back side of your bulletin. Each of the lessons highlights the faithfulness of God towards his people. And as we read the lessons, you might keep in mind following each of the reading of the lessons, page 106 and the responses that come that are now spoken. Page 160 is where you'll find the responses. Our first lesson from the book of Exodus, the Old Testament lesson, is Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 to 15. This is where God calls Moses to lead the children of Israel, his people, out of their time of bondage in Egypt. And in this lesson, Moses might come up with different reasons why he might not be able to do this, but God always points out that he is the faithful God who will bring his people out, and he will be there for Moses as their leader as well. We read in Exodus chapter 3. Moses was shepherding the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, a priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in blazing fire from within a bush. Moses saw that the bush was on fire, but the bush did not burn up. He said, I will go over and look at this amazing sight to find out why the bush is not burning up. When the Lord saw that Moses had gone over to look, God called to him from the middle of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. Moses said, I am here. The Lord said, do not come any closer. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have certainly seen the misery of my people in Egypt, and I have heard their cry for help because of their slave drivers. I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to deliver them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and the Jebusites. Indeed, the Israelites' cry for help has come to me. Yes, I have seen how the Egyptians are oppressing them. Come now, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you. This will be the sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will serve God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What should I say to them? So God replied to Moses, I am who I am. He also said, You will say this to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also told Moses, Say this to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And this is how I am to be remembered from generation to generation. The word of the Lord. Be and now we turn our attention to the psalm for today. Psalm 85. You'll find it in the front part of the hymnal. Psalm 85. God in his faithfulness listens to the requests and the prayers of his people, and that is what the psalmist speaks of here. Although he feels unworthy to come before the Lord, he knows that in his mercy God will hear his prayer. This morning we read the psalm. I ask you to join me in reading the whole psalm. We'll begin with the refrain portions, and then we'll say the refrain portions three times, uh, ending with the refrain and also the verses. We'll speak that together. Lord, in your mercy, hear my prayer. 
your goodness never fails. You, Lord, forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. You set aside all your wrath and turn from your fierce anger. Show us your unfailing love, Lord, and grant us your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear my prayer. Your goodness never fails. I will listen to what God the Lord says. He promises peace to his people. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Lord, in your mercy, hear my prayer. Your goodness never fails. And we return to our lessons for the day. Now the epistle lesson from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 10, verses 1 to 13. Sadly, the people of Israel in the Old Testament times often fell away from the Lord and followed other gods and other things that were more important in their life than the Lord. They serve as an example to us of what we should not be doing, as Paul points out. And he then points us to the way of looking to the Lord, because the Lord will always be faithful in doing whatever needs to be done for his people. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. <clears throat> for I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. He had them die in the wilderness. Now, these things took place as examples to warn us not to desire evil things the way they did. Do not become idolaters like some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to celebrate wildly. And let us not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Let us not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and so we're being destroyed by the serpents. And do not grumble, as some of them grumbled, and were destroyed by the destroyer. All these things that were happening to them had meaning as examples, and they were written down to warn us, to whom the end of the ages has come. So let him who thinks he stands be careful that he does not fall. No testing has overtaken you except ordinary testing. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tested beyond your ability. But when he tests you, he will also bring about the outcome that you are able to bear it. The word of the Lord. God. And now we ask you to turn to page 161 in the front part of the hymnal as our gospel acclamation for this morning down at the bottom of the page for the Lenten season. We'll join together in reading the entire acclamation here for this morning. We'll begin with the refrain, then the seasonal verse, and end with the refrain. So please rise and join with me in the gospel acclamation. Glory, praise, and honor to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Glory, praise, and honor to you, Lord Jesus Christ. And we now turn our attention to the gospel lesson today. The gospel lesson is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. particularly in the second part of the gospel lesson. It speaks of the faithfulness of God as he reaches out to help those who turn to him in repentance and faith. At that time, there were some present who told Jesus about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. He answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered these things? 
I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all perish too. Or those 18 who were killed when the tower in Siloam fell on them. Do you think that they were worse sinners than all the people living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all perish too. He told them this parable. <clears throat> a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He came looking for fruit on it, but he did not find any. So he said to the gardener, look, for three years now I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and I have found none. Cut it down. Why even let it use up the soil? But the gardener replied to him, sir, leave it alone this year also until I dig around it and put fertilizer on it. If it produces fruit next year, fine. But if not, then cut it down. The Gospel of the Lord. The congregation may be seated as we now continue with the singing of our next hymn for the day. That is hymn number 712. Hymn 712, Delay Not, Delay Not. Grace be yours and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning we look at the Old Testament lesson for the day. In Exodus chapter 3, I'll just read two of the verses once more. Verses 13 and 14. So the Lord is speaking to Moses out of the burning bush. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? 
God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. In Christ Jesus, dear fellow redeemed in our Lord, these past couple of weeks, two acquaintances passed this life in death. One was here at Zion, one was at Peace in Marshfield. Now, neither of them were members of our congregation, but there were times when our ministry, or they fell under our ministry. As far as my limited eye can see, they were God's children through faith in Christ. Jesus said, by their fruits you will know them. Well, both of them confessed their need of a savior from sin, looking to Christ in faith as that savior for salvation. And even though they have now passed on from existence on earth, my confidence is that by such repentance and faith as Jesus talked about in the gospel lesson today, they did not perish eternally, but even now they dwell in the kingdom of the Lord that is above. The Lord, who is constant in his promises to his people and in his care throughout their lives, which was evident. Constancy is the thought here. Not of the people, but of constancy in God. He is the Lord. He's Jehovah. He is Yahweh. He is the great I am. He is the one who is faithful, timeless, constant, unchangeable in his grace towards his people. He is the one who is absolutely independent in himself and personal in all his dealings with those who look to him in their need, even as these two old friends did. That's the one who appeared to Moses in the bush of flames that would not go out which symbolized that constant nature of God. This is the one who reveals himself in that strange name, I am. So what is he about? Moses was soon to learn that. Yeah, at this time, Moses had spent 40 long years in exile in the land of Midian. That's kind of towards the country that you know as Saudi Arabia today. At age 40, 40 years before this, he had fled to this place from the wrath of Pharaoh who sought Moses' life because Moses had slain one of the Egyptian taskmasters who was over the Israeli slaves because the taskmaster had mistreated one of the slaves. Moses' first 40 years were spent under the promising signs of his rise to prominence in the court of the Egyptian king. But after he had fled from Egypt, his next 40 years had descended to the level of a lowly shepherd guiding sheep in the wilderness. Now at age 80 in our lesson, he had humbly resigned himself to spending the declining years of his life away from his people Israel. He didn't seem to be sorry for leaving the luxury of the palace life behind in Egypt, for God had led him to find happiness in a home here in Midian. God had given him a wife, God had given him two sons, but that thought of his Hebrew brothers who were still languishing in their time of slavery in Egypt really troubled him. He remembered their bent backs, their hopeless groans, the whip of the taskmaster on their shoulders. Would God remember his promises to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Would God have mercy on the sufferings of his people, and would he eventually come to rescue them? Well, on this day that's in our lesson, Moses had led his sheep into the highlands of the Sinai Mountains, 
a plume of smoke and a flash of fire nearby caught his attention. A dry bush, no doubt, had burst into flames in the glare of the hot desert sun. As he watched, curious, it did not burn up and flare up and go out quickly, as thorn bushes are wont to do. It kept blazing. I will go over and see this wondrous great sight, why this bush is not consumed, he said. As he drew near, the flames grew brighter. Suddenly, a voice called out of the brightness, Moses, Moses. Moses probably stopped dead in his tracks. What could this be? Faltering, he replied, here I am. Come no closer, the voice responded. Take off your sandals, because the ground on which you are standing is holy ground. Now, how do you think one should react if the voice of God spoke to them? Hastily and tremblingly, Moses took off the sandals in reverence, realizing this was the voice of God. I'm the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob. Moses turned his face away from the flaming bush, afraid to look at God. I have certainly seen the misery of my people in Egypt, and I've heard their cry for help. I know their sufferings. I know their sorrows. I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to take them to a land that is rich and prosperous, a land said to be flowing with milk and honey. Come now, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people out of Egypt. That was probably the very thing for which Moses had prayed for many a year. God was answering the prayers of those people for deliverance. Did Moses bow his head in thankfulness? I would think so. But he doubted immediately his own power to carry out the task that he assumed God was laying before him. Forty years as a shepherd guiding sheep had taught him humble leadership that had eluded him earlier in his younger years. This once self-confident Moses, who sought to act as the deliverer of God's people before God had actually called him to that task, now was conscious of his own weakness. Who am I to go to Pharaoh, he said, and lead your people out? Have you ever distrusted yourself? Worse yet, know the lack of trust in God so that you hesitated to carry out God's will or work in your life? <laughs> I know that I have, although it disturbs me and my heart to think of it as a lack of trust towards God. But what else is that? When we neglect, fail, or even refuse to carry out whatever work God lays in front of us as his people. We might try to convince ourselves that we just don't have the gifts and the ability to do things. But in the end, isn't that a lack of trust in God and that which he can and he will work through us? If it is true that with him all things are possible... In our distrust, aren't we more like Moses than we want to admit? Perhaps looking at our failures of the past, we distrust ourselves to carry out the Lord's work in our lives and even dare, as Moses did, to make excuses for not doing it. You know, God must get awfully tired of human beings and their excuses. Sometimes we're nothing less than reluctant warriors for God the Almighty. 
And instead of being like the prophet Isaiah crying out, here I am, send me, Lord, send me. The more common reply to God's call is, me, Lord, not me, send him or her. How should God respond to our distrust and refusal? To Moses, he responded complete opposite of what we might expect. Instead of anger, God graciously assured, I will be with you. That is everything for us, especially in our inadequacy when we feel it. You know, Martin Luther once offered this prayer. Lord, thou seest how unfit I am to administer rightly this great and responsible office. And had I been without thy aid and counsel, I would surely have ruined it all a long time ago. We need strength and ability to accomplish the task, whatever he assigns us in life. He supplies it as he promises, very simply, I will be with you. Paul wrote in our gospel lesson today, God is faithful, he will not allow you to be tested beyond your ability, but when he tests you, he will also bring about the outcome so that you are able to bear up under it. He is the great I am, ever with you to guide and supply what you need. And that assurance, like the psalmist says, our eyes are ever on the Lord. What a tremendous support. But Moses wasn't convinced. If I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What should I say? I am who I am, God replied. Tell them, I am sent you. Aren't you kind of puzzled by that name for God? I have been. I've been so much puzzled by that that I have never preached on this text before. Partly because I don't grasp its fullest extent. But mostly because I don't know how to adequately present all that it entails. I am. It is a name that is so simple, yet so deep in its significance. So how does one capture its entire scope? I think the trouble is that we tend to view a name as a handle that we give to people. You know, a tag by which you can call them. But God's name is more than a handle or a tag by which we call him. God's name is all that he reveals himself to be to us in his word. His character, his nature, his purpose, and his workings for us. This name leads us who are full of doubts and fears at times to ask, what does this one have in mind? for me? What does this one feel about me? What does this one plan for me? And he simply answers, I am who I am. Can any of you say that? No, never. We are not today what we were yesterday, nor will we be tomorrow what we are today, but we are constantly changing. All you need to do is look at yourself. Earlier this month, a former member here at Zion sent me some pictures that were taken some 20 years or more ago at a church picnic that we once had at the lake. Can you guess what I looked like back then? Three of the poor people that were in that picture are no longer alive on earth. I'm the only one of those four who is still here. And 20 more years from now, I'll probably be where they are now. 
However, 20 years from now, the Lord Jesus will still be the same. He'll be the same as he was before Moses. For before Moses, yes, even before Abraham existed, he is. And by the way, this is the Son of God. This is Christ before his human form who appeared in that fiery bush. For it is only through the Son that God reveals himself and makes himself known to us. Only he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the great I am that is timeless, constant, unchangeable, absolutely independent, a personal being, a real being who called Moses by name from inside that burning bush. He knows the names of all those who are is, and yes, he knows your name too. And most of all, he is faithful in his grace to all of his people. He promised to deliver Israel from their bondage in Egypt, and he did. He promised to deliver us from our bondage to sin, death, and the devil, and he did. Through his suffering and his death and his resurrection. He is that great I am. The God who is ever with his people to supply their needs. The God who remains faithful in his grace towards them in every occasion of life. The God who delivers his people of faith from this life of captivity to sin, death, and the devil to that perfect life that exists forever at his side in that land that is above, which flows with much more than milk and honey. God grant us the comfort and the assurance that he, the great I am, affords to all whose eyes are ever upon him. For Jesus' sake, amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue in the service of word and sacrament here by confessing our faith and joining with all Christians in doing that. Today we use the Nicene Creed. You'll find that on page 162 in the front part of the hymnal. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The congregation may be seated, but keep your hymnals open to page 164. Page 164, as we join in the responsive prayer of the church this morning. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all your mercies, especially for the gift of your Son, through whom you have revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. Plant your word in our hearts and cause it to produce fruit in our lives. 
Strengthen and defend your church, that by your word and sacraments, faith may grow and love toward all may increase. Support all who spread the light of your truth throughout the world. Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. Raise up Christians to serve you in the ministry of the word and in all godly walks of life. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Give them wisdom that they may promote justice and hinder evil. Let your blessing rest on planting and harvest, commerce and industry, medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel and care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Be with all who devote themselves to any useful task. Comfort all who are in sorrow or in need, sickness or adversity. Remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. Grant them your love and take them into your tender care. And we pray for those who are on our prayer list this morning, those who have lost those close to them in death over the past several weeks, and those who are suffering different difficulties and illnesses, as well as people throughout the world. Lord Almighty, you calm and console your people with the powerful words, do not fear, for I have redeemed you, and I will lift you up. Comfort and encourage those who have lost people who were close to them over the last several days, those who are undergoing stress and difficulty in this world, those who are suffering any kind of illness, those who are suffering during this time, we ask that you would be with them. Assure them that the waters of trouble will not sweep over them. In your good time, bring them relief from their troubles. Use the severe trials that come to them to turn their attention to your great promises that they might find strength in you as they wait for your deliverance. And now hear us, dear Lord, as we pray in silence. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you, who now rest from their labors. Console all who are mourning or living with sadness. Keep us in the true faith and bring us at last to the joys of heaven. Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus, who died and rose again. Amen. And we now worship our Lord in bringing our offerings to him. Please rise. We begin with prayer. We give thee but thine own, whate'er the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. Lord God, Heavenly Father, through your Son, you are the great I Am, who provides for all the needs of your people. We bring a portion of the gifts that you have given to us in life to your altar today. We ask that you would bless them to your glory and so that the gospel might be preached in the world, that many others might know of your faithfulness and your constancy as you seek to bring them to you through Christ the Savior. Be with us now and grant us that peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
We continue now on the sacrament on page 165. And we ask the congregation to speak the responses again instead of singing them this morning. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who brought the gift of salvation to all people by his death on the tree of the cross, so that the devil, who overcame us by a tree, would in turn by a tree be overcome. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. And we join together on page 167 in singing, Holy, Holy, Holy. Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God of heavenly hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he, blessed is he, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, O God, through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our Savior, our Redeemer, and the messenger of your grace. Through him you made all things. In him you are well pleased. He is the incarnate Word, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hands on the cross and released from eternal death all who believe in you. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your Son's body and blood. Send us your Spirit, unite us as one, and strengthen our faith so that we may praise you and your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we glorify and honor you, O God, our Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, as we join in the prayer that the Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, also after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is poured out for you for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And now may the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen. And we join together in the singing of, O Christ, the Lamb of God. O Christ, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. O Christ, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. O Christ, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us your peace. Ah.
congregation may be seated as we now invite our community members to come forward to receive the Lord's Supper. Please follow the direction of our ushers. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given unto death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for your sins. And now may this, his true body and blood, given and shed for the forgiveness of all sins, strengthen you and confirm you in that true faith to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given unto death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of Christ, shed for the remission of your sins. And now may this his true body and blood, given and shed for the forgiveness of all sins, strengthen you and confirm you in that true faith to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given unto death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of Christ shed for the remission of your sins. And now may this his true body and blood given and shed for the forgiveness of all sins, strengthen you and confirm you in that true faith to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given unto death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for you. 
for the remission of your sins. And now may this his true body and blood, given and shed for the forgiveness of all sins, strengthen you and confirm you in that true faith to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Please rise as we continue in the concluding part of the service of Holy Communion on page 170. Now towards the middle of the page, the responsive versicles. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now receive with ben the benediction of our Lord with believing hearts. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Amen. The congregation may be seated for the singing of our closing hymn. We join in the singing of hymn 923. 923. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Although I must make a confession this morning about this hymn. This is a different melody that is in this hymnal, the newer hymnal, and I am a creature of habit. I told someone this past week that I was, let's see, what did I say, Beth? I was uh, old school. Old school. <laughs> Never thought I would say that before. But I would like to uh, sing this hymn this morning by the tune that I know it from the older hymnals. So I think you'll be familiar with it when you hear it. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah.
been strengthened in your faith by God's word. For you who are with us online, we'll be here again next week at this time. So join us at 9 o'clock next Sunday for our worship. And this coming week, we once again have our midweek Lenten service that will be on Thursday. It is here at Zion on Thursday evenings, supper at 6, and then the service will be at 7 following that. And uh, for you who, who are familiar with uh, Jane's father, um, Paul Nicholson, uh, he passed away this last Thursday. And uh, Jane told me that his funeral is this coming Tuesday. So keep the family in your prayers during that time, as well as all those who have lost someone close to them at this time or going through any other difficulty. Thank you. Have a good week.